Good morning. Welcome to the Reason Queens Municipality Regular Council meeting, Tuesday, December 12th, 2023. I'd like to call the meeting to order. First, going to begin with years of service award, and I'm going to do those over there. So the region of Queens Municipality consists of many different departments in many different areas and employs over 100 staff people. And events like this are a nice opportunity for us to get together as a group and recognize those who are responsible for the activities of our municipality. Many of you may not be aware of the operations within the region of Queens. We have the administration building, Hillsview Acres Home for Special Care, Engineering and Public Works, a grounds crew, solid waste management facility, a water treatment facility, a materials recovery facility, and a Queen's Place, a mayor facility. Today, we are recognizing 11 of the region of Queen's staff who represent a cumulus total of 130 years of employment and public service. Those who are here today have reached a milestone in their employment, ranging from five years to 25 years. There are two staff people receiving the five-year award. Lucas Harvey is not with us today, but Lucas began his employment with the Capital Works crew as a laborer, transitioned into water utility, and is now a certified operator at the facility. Ronald Levy. Ronald told me he's here to get his mugshot taken. <laughs> Ronald has been with us for five years. He's a general labor, right labor. He's well liked, and he is also a small equipment operator. So congratulations, Ronald, and thank you for working with the region of Queens. You're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Ten year awards. Alex Camo. Alex works with the engineer in public works. He's an operations operator at the Queen's Place of Mayor Center, and Alex began as support in the arena and has gained his class licenses. And thank you, Alex, for you. being with us. And Alex is 10 years. <laughs> Steve Burns. Steve Burns started 10 years ago as a general manager of Queen's Place and he is now manager of events, promotion, and sponsorship. So thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Absent is David Kelly. David's the operations manager at Queen's Place Ameris Center, and he holds a second class refrigeration plant operation certification, which I believe, Alex, you also have, and you've earned since you've been with us. So. Kudos to you. Amy Hatt is absent. Amy has been a residential care worker, first casual, then part-time, and now full-time at Hillsview Acres. 15-year awards go to Megan Roberts. So Megan started with us when she was about five. <laughs> but she actually started employment as a swim instructor um, didn't count in her years of service, but she came full-time as a physical activity coordinator. We call that MPAL. Then she was recreation coordinator. Come forward, Megan. And now she's director of recreation and healthy communities. So thank you very much, you. Megan. Absent today is Rodney Wiggle with the Engineering Public Works. Rodney's a heavy equipment operator, public works department, and can be seen daily making multiple trips between the solid waste facility and the wastewater treatment facility. Two staff have achieved 25-year awards. Audrey Wombolt. Come forward. Audrey started as the physical activity director at Hillsview Acres then became the recreation director. And just a short time ago, 
Audrey is in her new role as administrator of Hillsview Acres. Thank you very much, Audrey. It's wonderful to have staff start and progress and transition through. So. And Dwayne Hirschman is not with us. Dwayne, many people know as Munchie. And he's a senior trace person with the water utility. And he holds multiple certifications in water treatment. So it is a pleasure to work with all of the staff in the room and all of the staff that are here. And it shows a strong commitment to public service, to working with the community. And on behalf of council, I say thank you to not only the staff that have received their 5, 10, 15, 25 years, but to all staff of the Region of Queens. Two point zero changes approval to the agenda. I would like to move seven point six library selection um, to eight point six as discussion. And are there any other changes to the agenda? If not, I'll ask for approval of, of the Councillor Brown. If not, I'll ask for approval of the agenda as amended. All those in favor? Contrary? Passed. There are no presentations today. There are no petitions to table. Public question comment session. I ask anyone who wishes to speak today to please address themselves by giving their name and their civic address. And please know that you have five minutes in which to make your comments. When you wish to speak, you simply um, bring your, raise your hand, I'll acknowledge you, come to the podium and click the green button, and then you can speak once you state your name and civic address. Who, is, who here would like to speak today? Yes. Okay, first, just turn, okay, first, uh, yeah, right. I have a little handout for counselors if, yeah, uh, if you hand just it out later to pass it around or do it after. Whichever you prefer. Take into my five minutes? <laughs> no. <laughs> State your name, civic address, and your five minutes begin. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Radall, uh, 123 Main Street and 497 Shore Road, Mersey Point. I, like many others here this morning, am here to discuss the future of our library. All of you have seen my resignation letter uh, from a month, about a month ago, and I won't review its content here. I'd rather talk about the steering committee and the future of the library. First of all, the steering committee. As honorary chair, I was one of three members of the public on the committee, which met regularly for 18 months. Uh, there were specific terms of reference and a mandate. A lot of work, time, and effort was put into this committee. Unfortunately, the recommendations from our committee were disregarded, and here we are today. 
Of the three non-staff members on the committee, only Susan is left. I resigned a month ago, and Jessica, a school teacher, resigned before me uh, for the same <coughs> excuse me, reasons outlined in my letter. Uh, there's also, I should note, that there hasn't been any recognition of the resignations, to my knowledge. Susan hopes to speak this morning, and she'll speak for herself, but please understand she is as frustrated and disillusioned volunteer as well. Essentially, a steering committee as it currently exists has no credibility to provide direction for council and should not be used as a scapegoat by council for guidance going forward. So what is a path forward? This can be fixed. It's not too late. A county this size needs a library. Today's libraries are so much more than books. They are multi-purpose community centers, and if the call center is not deemed temporary, I fear due to its location, it will simply die a slow death versus being the community hub it was designated to be. I beg you to find a way to hit the reset button. We need a fresh start. Consult with your constituents, your taxpayers, form a new committee, a larger one, more public consultation, and certainly transparency. Take your time, do it right. I, like others who have resigned or might resign, I would consider becoming involved again. Please designate the call center or a more central location like the Scotia Bank or somewhere else as a temporary location and start the process again. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Who else would <clears throat> Who else would like to speak today? Good morning, Dan. Dan, Dan, red means on for some reason. Oh, okay. So. <clears throat> Dan McLaren, I live at 157 Waterloo Street, Liverpool, and I'm also here to speak on behalf of the library this morning. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of council, it's been about a year and a half since I first heard about the location of a new library. I am a frequent library user, and not only someone who borrows books, but who's someone who attends a lot of the programs. I recently heard about the library moving to the existing call center. I understand there's been a new heating and air conditioning system put in there, which is an essential thing for looking after books to keep a constant climate control. I would speak in favor of that location I've heard a lot of negative comments about how do people get there. Queen's Transit currently provides a lot of free transportation to folks who don't have cars to get to various music jam sessions throughout the region on a weekly basis and to other places. And I'm quite sure by approaching them, they would be most open to providing transportation. Also, I will note that adjacent to the call center is the only Laundromat in the town of Liverpool, and people do manage to get to that. Every time you go out there, there's people using the washers and dryers. So I don't really see the location as being a downside. So I would urge council to move forward, because if we don't move forward, it's only about 11 months from now, there's going to be another election, and nothing will happen, and it'll get moved to the next council. So I urge you to please pass the resolution to get the library relocated because if the current building, which is totally inadequate, decides to close and the library packs up their books and moves them away out of town, I don't think, and that's personal opinion, we will ever see another library. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. I see a hand in the back. Come forward, please. Good morning. My name is Suzanne Marcar, and I live at 225 Eagle Point Road. I didn't plan to speak today because I don't usually get up this early, <laughs> but um, I really, I found out about what's happening with the library yesterday, and um, it's 
really upsetting, actually. I moved here two and a half years ago, and I guess I expected when I moved to a smaller place um, that people would be more interested in serving the people that they represented. Um, when I read that email last night about how the steering committee was totally ignored, it really touched me on a deep level. I use the library a lot. I go to the garden club and um, I use it like twice a week. Sometimes I'm almost embarrassed on how often I go in there. I'm also a former teacher and I know how important a library is to a community. I used it a lot when I was teaching. I love where our library is located right now. It's right next to a school, and it's in a place where people can walk to easily. And from what I've seen, there's a lot of younger people and older people that do walk to that library. But what disturbs me most is ignoring the committee that you set up yourselves and um, making a unilateral decision. So I want to support Dr. Riddell's decision or presentation that it be a temporary location at the best and that you really start over. You have an opportunity to make Liverpool a really fantastic place with a gorgeous library and to actually attract more people here because it's a lovely place, and it deserves a much nicer library than the call center, really. Thanks. Thank you, Suzanne. Would anyone else like to speak? Good morning. I'm. Christopher Clark, 34 Bootlegger Road. I'm the chair of the Queen's Home for Special Care. I wanted to come to council today just to thank council and councillors for the support you have given us as we have been working towards this new build. Um, the community is excited by what we're doing and it would not have been possible without the partnership that we enjoy with the region of Queen's. Um, a couple of updates you might be interested in. Yesterday, I signed a mortgage agreement with Nova Scotia Housing for a huge amount of money. Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say it or not, but um, it's um, enough to make one blush. It's, so it's, uh, that's on track. We have just about to sign. If We may have signed. We've certainly agreed with the selection of the next contract which is to for the steel and the envelope of the building so that's un well underway so we are making progress um and i thought you'd like to know that and i'd like to thank you um, all of you and all of the staff for the help that we've been getting i don't intend to talk about the library the only thing i can say, would say is that the more activity we have in, the, in that area, the better it will be for our residents and our staff. We'll have 112 residents living there. We expect to have up to 170 staff by the time we have fully staffed the facility. So the more the activity that is down there, the happier our staff and our residents will be. So we, wherever you put the library is entirely up to you, but that's a, a consideration. But thank you all very much. And happy Christmas to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. And please come back with any updates regarding the new build. We're, we're always very interested as your new build will be our new home for Hillsview Acres. And please keep us in the loop. Please keep Audrey in the loop. Please keep her part of the team. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak?
Oh, okay, thank you. Good morning. I will take a brief moment to introduce myself. My name is Tara Dezina of 49 Main Street, and I am a former deputy municipal clerk. I'm also an OLA award-winning children's librarian. Please know that I am, I am deeply compassionate um, about the difficulty of the decision in front of you today, and I understand there's no easy choice. But as we all know, libraries have long been regarded as invaluable community assets, serving as pillars of knowledge, learning, and community engagement. However, merely having libraries is not enough. Accessibility is a key to unlocking their full potential. Libraries are not just repositories of books, they are cultural and social hubs that promote interaction within the community. Proximity within urban centers and near other community use facilities <clears throat> excuse me, encourage spontaneous visits and cultivates a culture of continuous learning, fostering inclusion and addressing the needs of a larger demographic. Placing the library away from pedestrian access limits these opportunities for a significant percentage of the population you serve. <clears throat> Restricting library access to a selected few leaves a substantial portion of the population without easy research, which actually results in social and educational exclusion. I will refrain from emphasizing the values of the library at this point. You're undoubtedly aware of their benefits. Therefore, I will shift focus, remind you of the municipal st strategic plan, the MPS, that actually this council adopted in 2022. This is an important di guiding document that encompasses a great deal of community engagement. Numerous examples within the MPS apply to the decision before you today. <clears throat> I will highlight only a few and encourage you to conduct your own research with the direction of the director and the CEO moving forward. Please bear in mind that you have already committed to adhering to the MPS. My first point, perhaps the most critical, is that unfortunately, throughout this important document, library services are not mentioned. In contrast, those schools, churches, and arts, and cultural communities and recreation opportunities are cited several times. I contend that this lack of mention may have contributed to the potential diminished recognition of the importance of libraries. That being said, though Section 4101, Community Uses, states, and I quote in full, community uses have long contributed to the health and identity of communities throughout the region of Queen's municipality. Often, centrally located community uses, such as schools, community centers, and medical facilities, provide essential services to both urban and rural areas. End quote. Once again, the term library is notably absent. However, by association with schools and community centers, the adoption of the MPS by this council suggests a commitment to valuing centrally located community uses, which should rightfully include encompassed libraries. Now let's um, revisit the critical point that reducing pedestrian access to a library restrict a significant percent of the population you serve, leaving a considerable por or portion underserviced. If you adopt the MPS you, you endorsed, you had a great vision. It was thoroughly thought out. It states, and I quote in part, the region of Queen's municipality strives to, strives to be a community that flourishes in harmony where diversity is celebrated, end quote. The term diversity here holds particular significance in this context. Diversity of library users includes non-drivers, individuals with mobility challenges, including those with wheelchair and mobility aids, um, the elderly population, people um, with financial resources might not, not own a car and may rely on walking, families with young children, especially those with strollers, communities with diverse cultural backgrounds who have individuals who prioritize walking as a cultural or lifestyle choice and individuals who choose sustainable transportation options to reduce their environmental impact. Relocating the library to a permanent location that requires transportation will exclude a large percentage of our diverse population, therefore being in conflict with the intent of your MPS. But on the heels of that, if council approves the Harley Humphrey site as a permanent location for the library, you are committing to the developing um, a community use facility around the car, subsequently impacting the environment. Your dedication to the environmental protection is explicitly articulated more than 15 times throughout your strategic document, notably in section 4.3, environment which states, and I'll quote it back to you, this municipal planning strategy was developed with environmental sustainable principles at the top of mind. Choices around servicing roads, development densities, and the placement of zones were all made in part to enable people to live closer to services, minimizing the need for travel for daily needs. That's end of quote. It is evident that the intent of your MPS was to emphasize council's desire for mental, environmental protection and the appropriate placement of community services. But in this case, the library therefore minimizes the need for daily travel and subsequent car use. Furthermore, by Permanently citing the library at the Harley Humphrey Drive and not committing to sidewalk installation council is not aligned with their already adopted policy regarding sidewalk and pedestrian connections, as outlined in your 4.5.5 sidewalk and pedestrian connections of the MPS. 
I will move forward because I'm sure I'm running out of time. Um, it, but it is expected that Council will uphold the same high standards for pedestrian safety as a mandate for the developers, which is also included in a strategic plan. But in this case, it will cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars to install that sidewalk. To conclude, I encourage you to collaborate with the director and CEO to assess how the decisions before you today might conflict with decisions that you have already made in the municipal planning strategies or and other applicable policies. At this time, I urge you to pause your decision, consider sites more pedestrian accessible, more in keeping with a community hub such as a library. Opportunities exist down on Main Street near the post office, as already mentioned. This area is more in keeping with such a community use facility. Today, I encourage you to pass a motion that directs your CAO to execute a deeper investigation regarding a more appropriate pedestrian-centric location for the library that includes sites on Main Street near the Astor Theatre and the post office or near the Amara Centre. But if you must make a decision that includes a Harley Humphrey location, I suggest you emphasize the temporary nature of your decision and reinstate the search for a more appropriate location at once. Thank you for the time. Thank you. <laughs> Would anyone else like to speak today? Please come forward. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Susan Deschamp. I live at 2 Milford Street and I am a public member and the vice chair of the library steering committee. I have a few points to make this morning. First, I do want to emphasize that at no point in a steering committee meeting was any motion entertained or any vote taken regarding the Liverpool Business Development Center. Originally that's on your agenda this morning as a recommendation. That recommendation did not come from the steering committee. Another point I'd like to make is that while in our uh, terms of reference provided by Council, it states that an agenda is to be provided to all steering committee members by the CAO a minimum of 14, uh, four days prior to a meeting. That has not been happening. Uh, we walked into a meeting on November 15th, sat down at the table, and the interim CAO handed us an agenda. There was no time to formulate thoughts or questions in regards to anything on it because we were not given it ahead of time, despite the fact that the meeting was called over a week earlier. Um, in that meeting, we were informed that Council had decided the best place for that library was going to be the Liverpool Business Development Center. In fact, point one on the agenda says future library location, Liverpool Business Development Center. There was no discuss it, no explore it. We were told this is what Council was doing. And way back in the beginning when all this, uh, we first started making recommendations as a committee to the uh, council, it was stated in a council meeting in no uncertain terms, steering committee makes recommendations, council makes decisions. So we were told this was a decision that had already been made. The library CEO was at that meeting and she asked uh, Councillor Romero for clarification if this was being looked at as a temporary location or a permanent location? The answer was permanent, with the caveat that future councils could potentially change that. So we toured the site that evening through the lens of this is where it's going. There's nothing we can do about it. How do we make this work? So the library staff, whatever building they're given to work with, will give us the best library that they can. They're a great bunch. They will do a good job. The main issue everyone had is the location itself. Uh, if you look through the results, the 110 separate entries on the online survey that municipality itself conducted early on in this process, that you'll find a repeated reference to central location, central location. And now you're moving it to the very fringes of town. So we're not in a central location any longer. Um, the first time we recommended the Sledding Hill location, we had councillors object that you can't move it that far from where it currently is, and that it would be unreasonable to expect uh, library users to walk across the bridge. Now you're asking uh, library users to walk to the fringes of town where the street lamps are fairly far apart, so it is not brightly lit, and there are no sidewalks. So picture this at 5.30 on a Thursday night in the winter when there's snow on the shoulders of the road. The uh, next point I would like to make is that after the council had asked the project manager to look at placing both a pool and the library on the Queen's Place grounds, 
uh, you had a meeting, so your staff, the council, the project manager present, and uh, this is according to the staff report that was attached to the PDF of your agenda for tonight. That's uh, next steps. You decided that it was possible to put the pool there, but not the library, which I, I would have expected that result. The issue I take is that there were next steps made at the end of that meeting for the pool committee, which was represented by both the deputy mayor and Councillor Romero. Now, Councillor Romero is also the chairman of our library steering committee. And in our terms of reference, part of that, that role is ensuring that appropriate research directions and recommendations are given to the steering committee. And yet the steering committee, the library project, there were no next steps. There was no directions after that meeting. We were dead in the water. And that cannot be laced on the committee's shoulders. That's on council. And I have one last point to make before I conclude here. That I only recently learned, through the grapevine no less, of the resignation of the other peer member of the committee. That leaves me as the only one. In the terms of reference, there is mention made for recruiting a replacement member. I have not even heard from the CAO, our chairman, anyone officially that the other member has resigned, let alone that anything is taking place to find another community member. And the more I think about how things have been going, and that leaves me as the sole public voice, community voice on this project, the more uncomfortable I'm getting. I'm just seeing flashing neon lights over my head going, ultimate scape, goat. So I'm just having to have some very serious inner debate of how long I'm willing to continue in that role if I'm the only public voice on the committee. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Susan. Would anyone else wish to speak? Good morning, Mayor Norman, Council, and uh, Regent staff. I am Susan McGibbon. I live at 127 Main Street in Liverpool. I just wanted to say uh, two uh, quick things. Um, there's a lot of passion for this library, which is a good thing. Um, and I think you have, um, you know, on the positive side, an extraordinary opportunity in front of you to reset. Um, this can be the most amazing community hub connected to the Amara Center, Queen's Manor. Um, uh, it, it's an extraordinary opportunity. And I urge you to very carefully reconsider your decision potentially to make the Liverpool uh, call center a permanent location. There is a hybrid solution. Is it perfect? No. It can be temporary while uh, we go forward with pursuing uh, pro a proper process, engaging all of the community in depth um, and making sure the location uh, with Queen's Manor and Amara Center is properly developed and designed and planned. I know some of you have expressed concerns about funding. And the one thing I wanted to just comment on there is that um, I, I don't believe the steering committee had time uh, with their mandate to even talk about uh, funding and grants. Um, and I think that is something that you all need to be thinking about. There is money for public libraries. There are grants for public libraries. So if you're concerned that you need to take part of the allocation for the new library to bring the call center up to public library health and safety code, I wouldn't be. Use what you need and let's go find more money when the process resets and we have the time to explore opportunities. And I think you have a very strong partner with the South Shore Library Board that you need to be connected to. And I have no doubt that they will be instrumental on helping to find uh, funding going forward. So today I ask you to think carefully and reconsider and do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Please come forward. I'm Donna Chen. I live at 55. Donna, we just, yep, yeah, thank you. I live at 55 Brooklyn Shore Road. I don't have a background in education. I'm a military veteran, but I've used libraries in my entire life. When I was looking after other people's children, looking after my own, it, it's been a huge part, both in, in, 
you know, recreation, enjoying the programs offered. And when I retired here more recently, um, during COVID, we didn't make use of the library other than picking up COVID tests. But when things opened up, I went to the Lunenburg Library and I thought I'd just bring in a little bit of a, an idea. They, we went for the artist's way and a couple of other programs. And that was my, my escape for me, not looking after my family. And I just wanted to say that the librarian there and the people who were also there were envious of the programs offered at our library. They didn't all appeal to me, but, but you'll have external people coming, especially to this brand new library. They'll want to take part in it. And I just wanted to give a little bit, well, walkability isn't possible for me unless I'm going to a spot that there's other things. And the Amera Center location makes total sense. And I just wanted to speak about, it was about a year ago that I found out about that. And I hadn't heard until just recently about any setbacks with it. But what I had heard was the excitement in the librarian, um, Holly Sweet, and she, she does a whole bunch of programming. And what the, the libraries were excited about was the vision of Queen's Manor being there and the enrichment for seniors and for the community and, and having the seniors be able to walk, be walked to programs instead of driven, not only like just the socialization of being able to go to the Amara Center and, and take part in events so much easier and, and not have, not that they're hidden away, but they are tucked out where the general community doesn't see them. And it's a benefit for, for the general uh, public and young people to see seniors in the community being supported and just all the programming. I've seen the new libraries in Halifax. There's been a few before we, we left HRM and came down here. And uh, I, I just see this vision of uh, an excitement. So I really do hope that you rethink the possibility of, of what it means for, for Liverpool. It's, it's exciting to me. It's this place has become just the dream world of me escaping all the stresses that I had in the military and, and having that library, it's been amazing for my mental health, both, you know, ebooks and, and the programming. Anyway, that's my two cents from a less educated, you know, it, but I think the heart of it. I, so now I'm starting to stutter, but I, I agree that the, the books do need to get to a safer position to be held until this could possibly project could possibly move forward. And I, I truly hope that it is. It, it could only benefit everyone in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Who else would like to speak this morning? Come forward, please. Good morning. Do I need to press on this button? No, okay, it's all good. <laughs> um, I'm here, actually, I am a staff member of the Social Regional Library, as full disclosure, but I am also a resident of Queens County. I live at 24 Atkins Lane in Port Midway. Um, recently, and your name? Oh, sorry. <laughs> My name is Elisa Hemian. I, um, recently, I became the Office and Finance Manager of the Social Regional Library, and having seen the differences from when my kids were small um, of going into the libraries and that's where I met a lot of the friends that I have now my social circle and now it's advanced even more to meeting more of the community and with the library located in the LCLC building in Bridgewater we often see families coming in while their kids or their other family members are playing hockey we have people coming in out of the cold. We're now looking at people that are also homeless coming in to get warm during the winter. We have advanced into more of soft social services. We have seniors coming in for help with their medical records, with their COVID vaccines, with their COVID tests. Having a place that is not as accessible by walking or by having to arrange for transit or having to pay for transit may actually prevent the community from being able to serve all of its constituents. I urge you to rethink the central location, having it close to a nursing home, a hotel, a recreation center, a grocery store, it would provide so much more benefit to the community. You can actually make it a focal point of your community, draw more people in, if it's further out of the community, you're then going to have to look at financing more infrastructure for sidewalks 
clearing all of that snow and rain, I just urge you to rethink and make it a community hub as it's destined to be. Thank you. Thank you. Who else would like to speak this morning? Come forward, please. Hello, all. <clears throat> Am I good with the speaker? Yes, you are. Hello. My name is William Lindsay. I am at 225 Eagle Point Road, uh, classed as Brooklyn by the post office, Eagle Point by everyone else through Eagle Wharf. Um, I've been here a couple of years now in the, in the region. I love it. I like Liverpool. I like Liverpool a lot. It's a town which punches above its weight, even though it isn't a town anymore, is it? I was surprised to find that out. Uh, Liverpool has a center, which is by the water. And as I understand it, it's a historical center. It's been there for a couple of hundred years uh, since settlers arrived and before that with other people. I agree so far with just about all the comments I've heard about why the library should be temporarily sited here at the call center building and not permanently. Uh, my personal I idea is that Liverpool, with its heart by the water, should place its important buildings here, yeah, rather by the water. This place should be by the water. I don't know what it's doing out here in the fields. And a library is uh, the heart of the community. It's, uh, it, it's with, it, historically a cultural center. Wherever libraries have been built, they've been built close to something that centers the city. You cannot have a library function properly if people have to go out to the fringes to find it. And anyway, I, I feel very passionately about this. And I will not go on about the what I've heard so far. I won't repeat what everybody else has said, which I found very agreeable. But my, my belief is that a library should be bravely set uh, where it historically matters in, in a place where it will be the part of the central heartbeat of the town and part of the historical flow of Liverpool and not out on the edge where nobody knows, well, where, where the tourists, for instance, don't know it's there, where people on the lighthouse route don't know it's there. I meet many people at the library who have come through from other towns, even other countries, who are there to find out about where they are, where they are in Liverpool at that moment. They, they, they're not going to be there. So please reconsider, make the call center decision temporary, uh, save the collection, save the flow of the library, and put it downtown. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Who else would like to speak? Come forward, please. Good morning. Uh, my name's Larry Gibbons. Excuse me. <clears throat> I live at 112 Main. I have been living here since COVID. Um, I cannot think of the worst location for a library than in the call center. I would appreciate it if every council member who does not have a library card abstain from voting on this issue. This is an important building and Liverpool will become an important place. We've had downs, but we're coming up. And that is down. Thank you. We will be watching. Thank you.
Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on this matter or any other matter? Seeing none, I'm going to move ahead to approval of the minutes, regular council, November 28th, 2023, moved by Councillor Hawk, seconded by Councillor Brown. All those in favor? Passed. Approval of the minutes, public hearing, November 28th, 2023, moved by Councillor Charlton, seconded by Councillor Gidney. All those in favor? Contrary, passed. Recommendation 7.1. <clears throat> Special Constable Hartung and Hurley. There is a recommendation within the package if a member of council would so wish to make that. Councillor Brown. I recommend that the region of Queen's Municipality declares the property located at 1828 Medway River Road, Riversdale, Queens County, Nova Scotia, <clears throat> and identified as PID number 70108071 as dangerous or unsightly as defined in the Municipal Government Act of Nova Scotia, and that Region of Queens Municipal Council cause an order to be served upon the property owner of 1828 Medway River Road, Riversdale, Queens County, Nova Scotia, requiring that within 30 days of the date of the service of the order, the following work be carried out. One, full cleanup of miscellaneous items strewn about the property, such as garbage, tires, personal belongings, and tools. And two, debris must be properly sorted and transported to the Region of Queens Municipal Landfill Facility or stored appropriately. Formal deadline for full cleanup is 30 days. And that if the property owner fails to comply with the order, the administrator may cause the requirement of the order to be carried out and all expenses incurred by Region of Queen's Municipality become the responsibility of the parties of interest. Second. Seconded by Councillor Gidney. Uh, Special Constables Hartung and Hurley, as we've already had the recommendation read, we will not need you to repeat it again. However, if you could just give us a quick background of what led us to to this point, because for those in the audience, generally our special constables can deal with these matters outside of this chamber. Good morning. Good morning. Property 1828 Medway River Road, Riversdale, Queens County, Nova Scotia, PID number 70108. 071, assessment number 05232473. The residence of 1828 Medway River Road in Riversdale is located in the woods along the Medway River Road overlooking the Medway River. Anyone driving by this properly, property can openly see that the residence and its yard is in total neglect. Currently, no one resides at the residence and it's falling into what we consider to be unsightly. Additionally, a large pile of assorted items, belongings, tools, tires, and household garbage have been dumped and spread across the front yard. This property has come to our roster only recently, and we'd like to have it cleaned up before the snow flies. We have been in contact with the property owner. Unfortunately, she was unable to attend this morning and she's been advised to pick up the garbage and transport it to the Region of Queens landfill facility. The owner fully understands the process leading to a full cleanup and has assured us that it will be done within the 30 days. That being said, we have a formal order uh, in process just in case that cleanup is not completed. Thank you, Special Constable Hurley. Are there any questions? Councillor Gidney? Councillor Hurley, you need to. Sh I'm sorry. Uh, how long has this been? This situation been going on, and when was the first contact with the resident? The formal complaint was received October 3rd of 2023, and approximately one week later, we made formal contact with the property owner. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, I'm going to ask for the question. All those in favor? Contrary. Passed. 
Again, uh, a motion, Councillor Hawks. I move that the Regional Queens Municipality Municipal Council declare the property located at 922 West Caledonia Road, West Caledonia, Queens County, Nova Scotia, and identified as PID number 70152517 as dangerous and unsightly as defined by the Municipal Government Act of Nova Scotia, and that the Regional Queens Municipal Council cause an order to be served upon the property owner located at 922 West Caledonia Road, West Caledonia, Queens County, Nova Scotia, requiring that within 30 days of the date of service of the order, the following work be carried out. One, demolition of the unsafe dwelling, outbuilding, and outhouse. Two, source separation and transportation of all demolished materials and debris to the Regional Queens Municipal Landfill. Three, leveling of property according, accordingly, removing holes and tripping hazard. Four, rec proper remediation of any well or septic remaining. And that if the property owner fails to comply within the, the, oper the order, the administrator may cause the requirements of the order to be carried out and all expenses incurred by the Regional Queens Municipality become the responsibility of the parties of interest. And then a seconded by Councillor Brown. And again, Special Constables Hurley and her time, we've we've heard the recommendation. So just a bit of a bit of background for council, please. Property, <clears throat> excuse me, property noted as 922 West Caledonia Road. West Caledonia, Queens County, Nova Scotia, PID number 70152517, assessment number 02403765. Uh, the property noted as 922 West Caledonia is noted as a possible threat to public safety. Once a rental unit located along the West Caledonia Road is now a vacant dwelling that is in further threat of collapse. The structural integrity has been totally compromised due to, mostly due to exposure to the elements. And further deficiencies are noted as the dwelling being insecure for some time and does not appear, and does appear to have been forced open. Both doorsteps are rotten. Most windows are broken. The roofing shingles are at the end of their life expectancy and are blowing onto the roadway. The fascia, as is the building, is open to wildlife. One entire wall has started to collapse. One small oak building is ready to fall. One outhouse requires demolition, as well as due to a threat to public safety and a threat of collapse. Bylaw enforcement has been in contact with the property owner, and she is in full agreement that the attention must shift to a full demolition to one dwelling, one outhouse, one building, and a cleanup of all construction and demolition materials and transported to the Region of Queens landfill facility accordingly. These are our recommendations offered to you today. And I must note that the property owner is here to represent uh, her property. I just had a discussion with her. She understands the recommendations and uh, the 30 days formal date, uh, 30 day date of formal order upon completion. Uh, she is looking, uh, due to financial restraints, to uh, perhaps pay on a monthly basis until the debt is cleared. And that matter, Constable Curley, could be dealt with through our finance department. I see yes from our director. Are there any questions of Constable Curley? Any questions? If not, I'll ask for the vote. All those in favor? Contrary, passed. 7.3 is the third on our roster, and this one has been an ongoing one. There is a motion within the package. Councillor Brown, this is within your district. I recommend that the Region of Queens Municipal Council declare the property located at 27 Church Square, Mill Village, Queens County, Nova Scotia, and identified as PID number 70105671 as dangerous or unsightly as defined in the Municipal Government Act of Nova Scotia. 
and the Region of Queen's Municipal Council cause an order to be served upon the property owner located at 27 Church Square, Mill Village, Queen's County, Nova Scotia, requiring that within 30 days of the date of service of the order, the following work be carried out. Full removal of the derelict and unsightly vehicle to either be properly stored at the rear of the dwelling as already agreed by the vehicle owner or fully removed by towing from the noted property. And that if the property owner fails to comply with the order, the administrator may cause the requirements of the order to be carried out and all expenses incurred by Region of Queen's Municipality become the responsibility of the parties of interest. Second by Councillor Charlton. And again, just to, just to review, we've heard the recommendation, so just to review of how we arrived here. Good morning. Uh, so just in regards to 27 Church Square, Mill Village, Queens County, Nova Scotia, at PID 7010-5671, assessment number 04918258. Uh, so the property noted as 27 Church Square, Mill Village, Queens County, Nova Scotia, has been on the bylaw enforcement roster for some time. The property has been reported as dangerous and unsightly due to extreme high grass and for hosting a derelict vehicle on the property next door to a property owned by St. John the Evangelist Parish All Saints Church of Anglican Denomination, which is a PID 7010-5663. Uh, this sheet of date is a derelict vehicle uh, described as a red 1988 Toyota Celica ST. Uh, the vehicle bears expired Nova Scotia license plates and over the years has deteriorated to what appears to be in non-roadworthy condition. The parent owner reports that the noted vehicle can hardly be described as abandoned and feels that the vehicle is of no threat to public safety. He doesn't appear to be concerned that the tree limbs which were either placed or fell onto the derelict uh, does not appear to be concerned with on the derelict vehicle. Uh, as per an email conversation with the property owner on August 11, 2021, he agreed to relocate and convey the offending vehicle to the back of his property out of sight until such time the vehicle could be restored. Ultimately, the owner has neglected to comply with the formal request. So on October 5th, 2023, a formal order to comply was issued with the deadline of October 31st, 2023. The property owner still refused to comply. The church property adjacent to the derelict vehicle, and this is an unfortunate circumstance of the situation, um, it does display a church bell, a plaque, decorative shrubs, and, an un and several unidentified graves at the back end of the property. Uh, so for over 150 years, there had been a church at this location, uh, but the bell that is there is the original bell from the church. Um, the, bell si the bell sits with uh, graves of families and has historical significance. Although, of course, it has no formal historical designation. So the recommendation today is a full removal of the derelict and unsightly vehicle to either to be properly restored at the rear of the dwelling, uh, as already agreed by the vehicle owner, or fully removed from towing from the noted property. Thank you. Thank you, Constable Hartung. Are there any questions? If not, I'll ask for... Oh, Count Deputy Mayor Fancy. I always get concerned when I, see, I hear about a bell. <laughs> it's always that bell could be, is that sitting on the ground? Is something that uh, it could be put onto a platform or something to be left there as a, as a significant for the, for the area? Yeah, so the, the bell itself belongs to uh, the church property. Uh, it's there and raised. Um, it's on uh, kind of a concrete stand and with the plaque as well that's there. Uh, and it's just help, it's there as a, kind of a, a visual historical uh, marker. Uh, the issue, of course, is that anybody who would like to go there to visit the graves or the former church site is immediately met by an abandoned vehicle that is right there and visible, um, kind of rotting away. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I'll ask for the question. All those in favor? Contrary, passed. Thank you. 7.4 Municipal Capital Growth Fund. Um, this is on our agenda as a result of discussion last week. And I believe we will have two directors here. Director Lane is, is absent due to um, 
um, he's just absent. Well, he it's out of the country on personal family matters. So. so there is a recommendation within the package which council sought to have brought forward. Does someone wish to make that recommendation? Councillor Charlton? I move that council approve the Mount Pleasant Service Extension Project in principle, commence the Mount Pleasant Services Extension Design Work, and apply for the Municipal Capital Growth Program as outlined in this report. And that's seconded by Councillor Gidney. So, Directors Grant or Vino, um, perhaps one of you would would speak to this. I see the nod to to Director Vino, and um, though much of this is an engineering explanation of of the estimated twenty one point five million, which is needed to fix infrastructure and extend infrastructure to the Mount Pleasant. And I know Director Vino can speak to the financial implications and the many unknowns that come with this project. I think if it's okay with Council, we'll, we'll tag team this one. I'll go over um, the high level um, components of this grant application. And maybe if um, Council wants to dig a little deeper, we can um, ask our Director of Engineering to step in. So as we all are aware, last Council, um, the servicing assessment that was prepared by C CBCL, CBCL was reviewed and it contained um, preliminary cost information recommendations to um, the servicing area and it, the extension of services for the um, Mount Pleasant area that we've been hearing about for a number of months here at Council. So Director Grant put together some estimates for us for the grant application. I'm just going to go over it very high level again. You can ask Director Grant some more questions. He split the estimate into two parts, although it is all one phase. So the grant application will be the whole thing. There's the recommended and the proposed. Um, there, there are things that have to be done before the proposed happens. So we have to look at investing in our current infrastructure and looking at our current capacities and building those things. The transmission mains we've always talked about in our capital investment plan, that's always been something that we knew was on the table. Um, but now we've had to add some wastewater lift stations. And also when we look at servicing extension, we also have the piping and all that infrastructure. So the way that um, the estimates have been done is this is recommended, so we have to do part A in order to do part B, and altogether, both parts are $21.5 million. And that cost includes labor um, at roughly 40%, and Director Grant has also mentioned to me that at the t if we do get the grant approved, at that time he'll sit down and do more a more detailed cost estimate, and we'll look at what we can do internally and what we cannot because it is a very huge project and the timeline is short. Did I? Yeah, so far so good. Okay. Um, so at the end of this council session, I have the application already prepared. I have to do some tweaking and there'll be a resolution that will be attached and that grant application will go into the province tomorrow if council um, passes this recommendation. We can apply for 50% of the grant. So we're applying for 10.7 million. I believe the entire fund is 32 or 34. I can't remember which. And that's for the entire province. So we're asking, we're, we're biting off a lot more than our fair share. But I think if we do a uh, quality application, which Director Grant has provided me the information, I think, to get there, is it shovel ready? No. And that may be a deterrent, but we're going to we're going to put our best foot forward and give all the information that we can to get it approved and go from there. Does council have any questions for more detailed um, engineering type questions? So just a clarification, uh, Director Vino, six point two million is the first phase you referenced of what we need to fix. And fifteen point four million would be new infrastructure that needs to be added. That's my that's my understanding. Thank you. Questions of Director Grant, Director Vino. 
Deputy Mayor Fancy. Uh, yes, you may say that we're not uh, shovel ready, but we have uh, access to equipment that maybe other people couldn't have because it's, it's hard to get equipment nowadays to, if somebody said they were even going to do something. So could we, uh, I guess we could do most of the work ourselves, as that would say, internally or not? Um, there's definitely elements of the project as a whole that we can undertake ourselves, whether it's engineering or, or the installation. Um, we have equipment that's ready to go at any time. That, that's a fair comment. Shovel ready by design? No. Um, we don't have the materials. We have some things we need to get prearranged and get <clears throat> excuse me, into place first. Um, there's some elements that are definitely shovel ready, 100%, um, some that are 0% shovel ready. So it's, it's a mixture of both. Can I just speak to that for a moment? That's why I made sure that I put um, in the staff report for council's consideration. This is a huge project. The project this size will require a lot of director grants time and director grants staff resources. So I thought that was a very important um, point to make because I know council has a lot of different priorities. Is, would you say, Director Grant, that this is probably one of the biggest yeah, projects that we've ever looked at at the region of Queens, so it needs to be considered carefully. Other questions? Councillor Brown? I, I take it that this is going to require a, a complete redoing of the uh, water utility, like we're going to have to end up going with uh, a UARB hearing to redo the water rates to, to fund this because this has to be funded, the sewer and the water, by the users not the uh, general taxpayer in Queens County? That is correct. So anytime that there is a water project that is uh, determined to cost above $250,000, an application to the UARB has to happen. And this is certainly within that guideline. So if um, when the time comes that the grant is approved, let's think positively, and I'll sit down with Director Grant, um, we'll be looking at the timeline to do a rate study and the application for um, that permission to do that project because you need better costing estimates than what we've put together right now before we move ahead with that. Other comments? Councillor Charlton. Thank you. So just to clarify um, and for context, when we look at this report, it says $21.5 million, which is obviously very significant. Um, however, this is not based off of, if I'm understanding correctly, the sole fa factor that there's been a request for extension of services to Mount Pleasant. As in, it plays a part to this, but based off what we have learned from our, our CBCL study with our wastewater, we need to do um, a lot of infrastructure upgrades to date. Is that correct? And that's all included in this report and this price estimate is all all the work CBCL identified as part of their project, the expansion and work that we had already anticipated doing such as a transmission expansion. May I continue? So, thank you. So um, if, for example, a developer to come, were to come forward in Brooklyn where there or other parts of Liverpool where there are water and sewer uh, services today, we are still dealing with uh, the fact that we have to invest in this infrastructure uh, in the long term. That's that's just what I want to clarify because it, I just want to make sure that uh, people are aware that this $21 million isn't to service a specific area of Queens. I think that's a fair comment. A lot of the work that will be done will support development throughout the, the entire service area, whether it's Brooklyn, um, potentially Milton, uh, Liverpool. Most of it needs to be done regardless in order to, to uh, enable sustainability of our system to provide development opportunities. Some of it is specific just to the Mount Pleasant development only, but it's not. It will benefit all users, I guess, as a whole. <coughs> And I would just like to make a point, if I may, to Council, um, that per Director Grant's point, when we get further along in this process, we can look at, you know, um, analyzing those costs and, you know, what is beneficial to the region as a whole versus what is beneficial to a certain part or a certain development and things like that. Just because that isn't here doesn't mean it won't exist. We'll get there if we need to. Any comment? other future comments? 
Um, before I recognize Councillor Brown, who's already spoken, anyone else wishes to speak? Councillor Brown? Okay. Is, is it fair to say, I guess, that uh, you're not asking us right now to, to put our hand up and, and write a check for $21 million? We're just writing, we're agreeing now to, to go ahead with the application process to the government to see if they will fund us and that then the big decisions come down the road. That's correct. It's my understanding that the way that these things work, because it's really the first time I've been involved in it, is that we're applying for a grant. And um, you as council are committing to fund the remaining costs that are not covered by the grant. And should this not happen, I don't think that we'll be punished for that. It's just we need council support to know that we're going to fund it if we get it and where it's going to come from. Yeah, just one thing. Um, but at this point in time, we do not know where we will fund $10.5 million, nor you, but you will be able to, if we are successful, break this amount down into what is required to fix our system. And I believe I already asked if that was the 6.2 million, mm -hmm. which is required to fix our system. And then of the remaining 15.4 million, you will be able to break down how much of that is specific to the developer's request for extension to Mount Pleasant. And we would be able to divide that 15.4 into into what benefits all and what benefits them. And then at that point in time, deal with who pays, who pays for, for the, for the bulk of it. And CAO Cody, please. Yeah, um, a couple of points there, just for clarity for Councillor Brown, what you'd be committing to today, if you make the motion that's in there, um, is doing the design work and applying for the money. You can always say, no to the grant if you're approved like that would come back to council for sure and to mayor norman's point as part of the growth planning work we still need to figure out what an appropriate way to break down who pays for what needs to be worked out and um and and so to councillor charlton's point i don't think that you're saying um, all 21 million would be committed in this way or this way. We're just saying, in principle, we're trying to move forward. So I just want to clarify a couple of thoughts there. Is there Are there any other comments or questions? I believe it's very important that we do fix our existing infrastructure. It is very important to provide infrastructure for developers who wish to grow our community. However, I think it's very prudent upon us when the time comes to decide who pays for the extra growth that's required. Councillor Charlton. Thank you. Um, I would echo those comments. Uh, it, it's been noted before that we don't have, um, you know, clear policies around development charges and things like that. I know in speaking with the town of Bridgewater, when Glen Allen Drive was developed, um, the town of Bridgewater put that infrastructure in and there were development charges uh, that were brought back in from new developments. So I think that all of those things um, will have to be ironed out, but I do think it's important that A, we fix the issues that we know we have um, because there's no way around that. And obviously um, when there's big costs like this associated with this, um, you know, people are concerned about how to fund them. And in some of these cases, when you have infrastructure like we do and we need to fix it, um, there are possibilities that we have to deal with tax rate increases for things like this. And I know other municipalities aren't alone and that they've had to do that too. Um, having a clear picture and knowing that we have infrastructure issues that have to be fixed, you know, yesterday. <laughs> um, we, we have no choice but to move forward. And I think that if we can also tie this into an extension project because the population, um, you know, there's a target to double our population from the province. And so uh, I would be hopeful that we are supported with this request from the province, recognizing that it is a big ask, but um, I think it's a step in the right direction and I will be supporting it. Thank you. Any other comments before I ask for the question? 
So all those in favor of making an application um, for the infrastructure funding from the province? Contrary, passed. Request for funding for New Year's Eve. There's a, a recommendation there. It's, it's respecting the Royal Branch's New Year's Day levy, which the Region of Queens has been co-funding for them um, for many years. Councillor Gidney. I move that the Council of Regional Queens Municipality provide grant funding to NS slash NU Command Mersey Branch 038, the Royal Canadian Legion, in the amount of $750 to host a New, to host a New Year's levy to be funded from other expenses, general government. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Fancy. Any questions? All those in favor? Contrary? Passed. Discussion, we'll do a few of these, then we may take a quick break. Um, 8.1, Director McLeod. So we have two, two requests for road namings. They fall within policy. If someone would um, make the, I do not see a motion, yes I do. I don't see a motion. Oh, they're discussions. Sorry about that. <laughs> they are discussions. I was thinking they came from PAC. So road naming, Lingley Lane, perhaps we can do both of them at the same time. They both come from the same person. But however, Director McLeod. Uh, yes, Mayor Norman, just a brief background. Um, the planning department has received a request to uh, to name uh, a new private road off Cobbs Ridge Road in Liverpool as Lingley Lane. Uh, the first name choice of Lingley Lane is acceptable um, to the planning department as no similar or same road name exists within Queens County. Um, in this case, uh, the new road is actually owned by the applicant um, and, uh, yeah, uh, and the owner has submitted uh, the petition that is attached to the staff report. So the request is in line with the, the, the region's naming and renaming of roads policy. Any questions or councillors who do not agree with moving this forward as a recommendation at our next meeting? Hearing none, perhaps we can, councillor. I would like to move that this come forward as a formal recommendation at our next council meeting. And seconded by councillor Brown. All in favor? 8.2, road naming in the Somerville area. Director McLeod? Yes, uh, this uh, is another uh, request to name uh, a new private road, um, which is off of Willow Lane in Somerville Center as Audra Lynn Lane. Uh, the first name choice of Audra Lynn Lane is also acceptable to the planning department as no similar or same road name exists within Queens. Um, in this case as well, uh, the road is owned by the applicant and the, uh, the request is in line with the region's naming and renaming of roads policy. And once again, is there anyone who objects to this coming forward as a formal recommendation at our next meeting? Councillor Gidney, you have a question? No, or yeah. you, you, you're... I recommend that the request be brought forward for next week's council meeting in January with the motion to And seconded by... Councillor Muse in whose district it is, and asked for the question, all those in favor? And this passed. 8.3 is a bit of um, a lengthy discussion, or perhaps not, uh, Mill Village Fire Department truck purchase. Councillor Gidney? Could we take a, a short break a quick now, break? please, sure. if you don't mind? Thank you. Okay. So we'll do a 10 minute, 10 minute recess. And we will resume at oh. past Councillor Doug Adams had this made, just for anyone who ever wonders where that came from. Mill Village Fire Truck Purchase, Ms. Vino. So before Ms. Vino speaks um, to those that are here and to members of council, 
Fire truck purchase is a very hot topic among fire departments. And we're still using a schedule from 2016, which does not reflect some conversations over the past year between fire departments. And now we have a fire truck purchase um, coming before us. So, Ms. Vino, perhaps you'll explain how you were contacted, when, and why this is now here, and, and what it means. So at the end of November, I was contacted um, by the Mill Village Fire Department regarding a guarantee on the loan payment for a fire truck that they were going to be purchasing and taking possession of in January. Um, the proposed schedule, which has not been adopted by all the fire chiefs, did have the Mill Village Fire Department buying a fire truck this year, but it was in the 24-25 fiscal year, so it's after April 1st. So they're, that's they're one of the things that you'll have to decide today as council. Are you going to permit Mill Village to buy a fire truck outside of the proposed plan that was seen by the chiefs but still not approved? or outside of the policy, because right now there is no valid um, fire truck purchases in the policy because all the chiefs have to agree on the schedule. And we're hoping that in the, at the January meeting, we'll get there. So there are two things that we need to, you need to decide today as council. One, if you're going to agree to the purchase by the Mill Village Fire Department, they've been offered this truck. Uh, I believe it's fair to say they didn't expect to be offered a truck this early. Um, but the broker has the truck. The truck is, I believe, in Bridgewater as we speak. And um, they would like to take possession of the truck sooner rather than later. And so that's why we're here today. And there's a loan guarantee associated with that truck. The current, well, I can't say current because there is no current, but the, the benchmark amount that council has always provided for funding for fire trucks is $275,000 to be provided to the departments over 10 years. So not in the year of purchase, but for 10 years thereafter. And that's supported by the truck reserve that we fund two cents per year for our operating budget. And so this is not a question of funding. The funding is there. It's a question of does council wish to approve the purchase of a fire truck outside of having an approved schedule in the policy? And does council approve having staff apply for ministerial approval to provide the guarantee on those loans that is required by Mill Village in order for them to get the financing that they require to purchase the truck? I believe that's it. Very well said. Questions? Councillor Gidney. Thank you. Um, I, I've reviewed this. I, I'm part of the, 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 the fire, the, the emergency services committee. Um, and as previously explained, the, the purchase of the truck con con contravenes the existing policy. The problem with the policy that we had a revised truck schedule presented to the fire chiefs back in September. They agreed in part, providing that we moved one of the purchases from 3334 to 3132. They were notified that that would not work, the change was not feasible because the reserve did not support the change. But for some reason, they were thinking, okay, we can still do this. We can still do our purchases. Um, so on November 30th, we, uh, the, the revised schedule was, re -mail, or was, was emailed to the truck, to the fire chiefs for their consensus. We have not yet cons received consensus on that to date. So the points that, that I've considered when I review this, the revised, if the revised uh, schedule was enforced, the request would be four months early, which is still workable. We can still work that because it takes up to two years to get a truck sometimes. A new truck, it takes approximately two years. In this particular case, he looked at a truck previously in Quebec for 650000 The Bridgewater truck, similar, 620000 a $30,000 difference. Truck orders take up to two years to deliver, 14 to 18 months for a chassis. So we're talking like things have got to be done prior to them purchasing in the year that they can purchase. The dealers anticipate um, the truck prices will increase by 6% in January 2024. So there again, it's going to be, we're talking another 6% of the $600,000, another $36,000. Um, and, and the last thing, in any event, 
Most requests for truck, truck purchases by the fire departments at this point in time would contravene the existing policy and would need to come to council for approval. So I'm, I'm recommending that the request to purchase a truck be moved to our January 9th meeting as a motion. Thank you. So it's been seconded, uh, moved and seconded that this come back as a recommendation at our first meeting in January, which is the second Tuesday in January. Um, any further? Any further questions? Pardon, Councillor Brown. I think we've got a policy in place that, that says that uh, for all the chiefs to, to have to agree to this, and, and I have a problem with going for ministerial approval when we're contravening the policy. Councillor Gidney? Uh, on the second part, the, uh, the boring guarantee resolution. I don't believe that there is boring resolu resolution here. The, uh, the, we don't, from my understanding, we do not uh, guarantee the loan. What, what the bank expects from us is a letter verifying, verifying funding. So if, if that's the case of verifying funding, that's not a guarantee. At no point, if, if the fire departments do not make their payments, does it come back to the region? I believe that our staff have found out some information that we have not been following in the past. Director Vino? Ministerial approval does um, establish a guarantee by the Region of Queens for the amount of the funding in the temporary borrowing resolution. So we are on the hook for the $275,000. That's why they have to do a financial analysis. And that's why it has to go to the minister to make sure that, you know, God forbid, there's a default on the loan that the region can um, stand up for the $275,000 that they guarantee. That's my understanding. So I, I do have a temporary borrowing resolution prepared. Um, which will I will bring again now that um, we're going to move the actual purchase agreement to the January meeting. So then I will have to have another, uh, will we have to have a discussion on the borrowing resolution and then bring it to the next meeting as a, I don't know, maybe the CAO can give me some stuff. Um, uh, through the mayor. Um, so we did ask uh, Councillor Gidney a couple questions around this and ministerial staff made it very clear in all scenarios we need to, if a fire department is borrowing money to buy a truck, the municipality has to guarantee it. And the minister has to sign off on that first. And I'm not sure that's necessarily been happening up to this point. Um, but all we can do is fix it going forward. Um, thank you. Um, I, I'm thinking of it on a different level, that when we guarantee that we're, we go in, we sign the loan documents with them, I'm understanding that has never been done. We're, we're not signing the documents. We're only, yeah, even if they were just borrowing the money, we don't have to sign the documents, but we're still on the hook for it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, questions, Director Fino. If this is approved, does the Mill Village Fire Chief understand that the first payment would not be until ap after April 1st, 2025? I believe so, because that's a standard practice with all the fire truck loans, but um, I'll make sure that I talk to Chief Why Not um, myself once this whole um, matter has been decided by council to make sure that I communicate with that. Um, I would ask that council provide me some direction in terms of the guarantee because the guarantee requires a motion by council and do I bring that to the January meeting as a recommendation or are you going to discuss that at the January 9th meeting and then I bring it to the following meeting as a recommendation if you decide to do it because it's in the policy that we do it. That's in the policy that Region of Queens provides the guarantee. So I just need to know because of the protocol that we have of discussion first and recommendation second, 
it's my understanding that you have agreed to the purchase of the trucks. That comes back as a recommendation in, on January 9th. Do I bring the guarantee for your approval to the January 9th meeting as a recommendation or do you? Okay, thank you. Let's let's clean up one motion at a time first. So we did have a motion from Councillor Guinea and it was seconded by Councillor Muse that the that they did approach approve the purchase of the fire truck so let's for the mill village so and that we're seeing that come back forward as a recommendation so let's vote on that one first all in favor of seeing that come back forward as a motion um i was just going to clarify that we hadn't voted on that yet but i just i i don't have a great level of comfort sitting here um with the fact that there hasn't been consensus there's been a truck policy looked at but it hasn't been like that it was a writ from what I understand from Councillor Gidney, it was agreed upon um, if a certain aspect was moved up, that couldn't be met because of a reserve balance. Um, so my question is, is this being uh, discussed at an emergency service committee meeting? Uh, is there one planned? I just I'm just uncertain and I feel like I don't have enough information to make that decision at this time. So I just like some clarification. CEO Jodry, could you speak about the upcoming emergency services meeting? Yep. So um, great questions and, and through you just for some clarity. We tried to organize the fire chiefs last last week to to get um, some understanding about where they stood on this issue. We couldn't get them all together in time. Um, it looks like we'll get most of them together tonight to have a meeting. Um, we did email all of them. Uh, some didn't respond to the email confirming whether they were in agreement or not. Um, and, but I do think we've gotten some clarity from the two chiefs later that they are um, in agreement, but they do want to visit, revisit, and, and try to sort out the whole truck replacement schedule um, thing, but they don't want to hold the one fire department up. So I, I don't know if that answers all the questions. If not, I'm happy to jump in again. Councillor Charlton. Thank you. So in that case, um, if this is a motion that's coming back on the first council meeting in January, there's a meeting tonight, which will allow for more discussion. Um, I'm okay with moving forward in that case. Thanks. And council should also be aware that um, North Queens Fire Department recently purchased a rescue vehicle, which I believe is being delivered this week. And again, it's not on the schedule because the fire chiefs had somehow assumed that that schedule that they had seen that's in our packet was one that they could work from. So North Queens rescue truck is coming, I believe this week, if not next week. And so we also need to deal with, with all of that as well. So um, anyway, so let's get back to the first motion. A call for the question about bringing the the matter back. Um, there was a second. Or... I just yep. just if I if I could just on the on um, Councillor Charlton's point, just for clarity, not all fire five fire departments will be present tonight. One. Councillor Gidney. Just like to make, make the point that in the agreement, or the, the uh, truck agreement, that was that issue was not. They all agreed to that those issues to purchase from Mill Village for for uh, California to purchase her trucks. That was not the issue that, that stopped them from con or get for uh, consensus. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for for that clarification. But the point is that truck purchase was never ever approved by council which means the one in our policy is the one we're supposed to work with but you're correct they were all in favor of the north queens rescue fire truck they were all in favor of the mill village fire truck purchase but we need to get this policy updated and it does read that it must be by consensus and if somehow unfortunately we're not going to get consensus among fire chiefs, and that's a different discussion for a different day. But these two tracks were both agreed on by all five fire chiefs. 
Um, Deputy Mayor Fancy, anything else to contribute to this discussion before I ask the question about bringing this back at our next council meeting for a motion? Oh, uh, yes. It just goes along with what we were talking about. It's uh, first off, the uh, this fire truck that's coming forward, but the, the problem is, isn't the this year, it's for the future years how it doesn't balance the reserve. So the, the, the question is, isn't about the Mill Village fire truck, it isn't about the rescue truck out in, in North Queens. It's about as the future years, how they could all uh, work together and how we, the reserve would work with it. So that's, these aren't the issues that the, that the fire chiefs have. The other thing too, which I found kind of interesting when I was talking to one of the fire chiefs, he didn't quite understand when he said, we said uh, uh, 23, 24, he thought that's January. So uh, the, a lot of them, I think, start to think that uh, the first year is January. It isn't. It isn't April when our budget is. So I, it's just some other things. I think some they, there was a little confusion. It's nothing else. Is everyone in favor of bringing this forward as a motion at our next meeting? Yes. Anyone opposed to that? And then to Director Vino's question. Um, is the matter of the borrowing resolution also coming forward at our next meeting? Does she bring that forward as a recommendation? Because you can't do one without the other, really. So yes. So we, we either need to keep consensus with the way we do things. So we really should, if someone wants to recommend that the borrowing resolution come forward as well. Uh, so there was already a motion made from Councillor Gidney, so... The he said the purchase. He didn't talk about the borrowing resolution. And so I uh, would move that the borrowing resolution also come forward at the next council meeting in January. Thank you. And that's seconded by... Just so because staff need to have clear understanding from council what to bring forward on these agendas. Everyone, Council Deputy Mayor Fancy? Second. You're going to second it? By, okay. Is everyone in favor of that one? Councillor Brown, you wish to speak? I, I just hope we can get uh, the emergency services people together to try to get consensus between now and then because I, I, I really don't have a strong feeling about guaranteeing loans on something that we don't have consensus on that doesn't match policy. It's, you know, it's, I think we've got to work hard to try to get consensus. And I think some of the, uh, some of the chiefs are using their, their lack of consensus to try to protect their, their territories for, for whatever reason. And, and I think we have to work with them to hopefully get them to consensus. And our next meeting comes very quickly. Yep, it does. Okay, so question, Councillor Muse, you're, you're, do you wish to speak? I've been on this fire EMO committee four years maybe, I'm not sure. The consensus doesn't work. The policy 82, we have to change it to a majority. We're never going to get the guys to agree on anything. We thought we had agreed on this truck schedule, and then come to find out we don't agree on the truck schedule. You know, at the meeting, they all agreed on this truck schedule. And then they put in that maybe we could change it to something else. We found out financially we couldn't change it to this. So then it went back to the revised schedule that we had in the first place. Now the they're holding out on the revised schedule. Council can make the decision to give them the money to purchase a fire truck. It was on the schedule. They need a fire truck. You know, the system has been going too long without renewing the trucks. The trucks are getting older. They got to replace them. You know, if we keep putting it off, we're going to be in worse shape than what we are now. You know. This truck happened to come up fast. You know, it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. You know, if they didn't have this truck, they got to wait two more years before they get one. So, I don't know how we're ever going get to get along to give us a consensus. And like I said, I think we're going to have to change the policy 82 to a majority vote. Thank you. And I may agree with you on that. Um, the consensus definitely is not working within that policy, unfortunately. But one can only hope that they're fire chiefs 
and they are all working for the health and safety of the residents of Queens. And there's always miracles that happen. So, so Director Vino, you understand where you're going on this? Okay. Expense policy interpretation challenges. Council CAO. Do we? Oh, just on the last one, just to show our hands of who wants to bring forward the the borrowing resolution. The borrowing resolution. Expense policy interpretation challenges, CAO Jodry, you've added this to the agenda. The floor is yours. Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> well, I, I think the report sort of lays out um, some of my challenges and uh, just an interpretation. I thought it would be helpful for me as sort of the one that ends up signing off on a lot of these things that I would appreciate some clarity from you as the as the policy maker on what your intent was. Um, and, and I think I spelled out where some of the challenges are for me. Um, especially considering that, that the policy applies to both council and staff. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions if there are questions about, um, I guess, my question. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I'm just looking for some clarity from council on this topic. So basically, it revolves around travel outside of your district. Because within the policy, there is travel within a person's district if they travel 50, over 50 kilometers to meet with a constituent or attend something, then the travel within the district is <clears throat> covered. However, if you travel outside of your district, let's say, for example, and Councillor Charlton's looking at me. So let's say, for example, um, all of the region of Queens are invited to go to an open house at the North Queens Nursing Home. In the present policy, that is not, or it's been interpreted that that tr travel would not be covered for, say, Councillor Muse to travel to North Queens because he was invited to attend something in the area. However, if Councillor Muse was deputy mayor and was invited to speak and I was unable to speak, then deputy Muse would put in travel expenditures. So the question comes down to, some of our councillors are in very far outlying areas. We're all invited to travel to things that mostly happen in, within South Queens. So it's very affordable for those living in close to say South Queens where the events are held to be able to travel affordably. If you are say, and, and I'm, I'm not implying this, this is relevant too, but let's say if you were Councillor Hawks or Councillor Brown, and travel in and out of here is a considerable length, then it's adding expenditures to your ability to attend and be seen as a counselor, more so than say Deputy Mayor Fancy who lives in Milton. Deputy Mayor Fancy lived in Milton. He could attend every invitation that he's invited to most of all, most of them in South Queens for very minimal cost. So he's seen as a boat and a boat and he's talking to his constituents. So the question that CAO Jodry brought to point was the was within the, the, the municipal guidebook, it talks about new councillors and how it's your role to go out and meet and talk to the constituents, not just your constituents within your district, but all the constituents in Queens. So what the question boils down to is, does council wish to look at a policy that would approve travel for a counselor anywhere within Queens for any community matter they wish to attend? Is that basically it? Uh, I, think, I think you spelled out eloquently uh, one section, although I would say that the policy does in some cases contradict itself. So for example, about travel within the district, it's still somewhat contradicting itself. And so for example, there's a part in here about a designated role. That's, that 
what is a designated role is quite frankly up for dis, up, up for debate. I'm not, I mean, it sounds like it's simple, but it's not if you really spend some time thinking about different examples and, and, and how that applies. So to, to Mayor Norman's point, I could use some clarity and we can bring back revisions to the policy for council, um, but it would be helpful to get a sense of what council's intent is around these topics so we can bring something back if, if, if possible. Councillor Gidney. Thank you. Uh, so what is, how, what's the arrangement now? I know what the policy says, but what is the arrangement now? Are, are they reimbursed for, for travel within? They're not. Okay, thank you. Yes, within your district. If you travel over 50 kilometers within a district, and that was put in many years ago when some of the districts grew, when councillors when, when we went through a review and had fewer councillors, some of the districts grew hugely. So to travel within one's district, you'd be traveling over 50 kilometers, where someone else might have a district and they might only have to travel three kilometers to meet everyone in their district. So it was added about the 50, but to CAO Jodry's point is, what is a designated role? It's always been assumed that a designated role would be if you were asked to speak or take part in something that was happening okay. at the thing. So question, do you, want, do you want staff to look at funding council travel anytime within Queens if they're asked to travel or invited to something? Do you want a draft policy? Do you want it to wait? This will have implications on our budget as for travel costs um, when when any when all counselors. So the question is, what would you like to see as travel for for council? Also keeping in mind that we have not yet heard back from the review about staff wages and future council um, pays for the upcoming year. So there's many financial implications involved in this. Councillor Charlton, who's been so patient. Thank you. Um, I am a fan of keeping it the way that it is if it's in within one's district, um, with the exception of exceeding the 50 kilometers. I know Councillor Brown has a very widespread districts and um, if he's traveling to one end from, uh, you know, his homebound, it, it is quite far. So I, I understand that. I'm okay with that personally. Um, I know that we as counselors have been invited to places like North Queens and things like that. Um, and I, I'm not aware of uh, it being an issue where there wasn't an expense claim. I know often um, if we're going to like the parade in North Queens or something like that, generally there, we, we carpool and, and we keep it pretty basic. Um, I also did flag, though, in this policy, uh, the fact of uh, the designated role, because I could see how it really would be up to one person's interpretation. And I can also see how there's a staff side to this component, too. So it's my understanding that, you know, staff, if, if Joanne, for example, wanted to go in and to Halifax, like in this package says, uh, it doesn't specify her, but it would be her, I would assume. So she should be able to make that call and 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 do something like that that would benefit all of us here at the municipality. So I think there's a council side to it too that um, so it wasn't necessarily up to one person's interpretation. If a counselor wished to go to a housing meeting in Halifax or something like that where they felt they could get value to bring back to their council table, um, it makes sense. And so I don't see a lot of um, this policy needing revision, except for I think it would be very simple if you just took out um, under Section D and for which they play a designated role during the meeting or function, because then it's not up to one person if that particular person um, holds value in attending. Other comments? Deputy Mayor Fancy? <laughs> I, I like the, uh, I think even one word that uh, Councillor Charlton put in is an invite. Uh, because if you don't, uh, if you don't have something that becomes uh, a point, then it becomes, you could be, use it for anything. Well, I went down to see 
John Brown for of over this and and because he was having trouble with his his ground or something, you know, because you you you've got to have something that has a a parameter, and uh, so the parameter would be an invite. If uh, there was a a meeting at, at one of the halls and and Carl had to go to the hall because they had a had, and then he had to go up in uh, uh, say up. Uh, towards Kedji or something, you know, and, and then he, they, they called him and invited him to come. Well, that's now not his choice, but it's an invite. That then, it, then that way it could, uh, I think it could, then we could have something, a parameter to go back to. Other comments? Councillor Brown? I think part of the issue that uh, that's come up in the past is, is we've had a lot of uh, a lot of functions lately. We've had the Olympic Wall. We've had the uh, the Queen's pl the uh, long term care home funding. The opening of the uh, play park, where councillors have been, I would say, expected to to come because we're a funding partner. But we don't have a a speaking part in those events, and those uh, those expense claims have not been been paid. You know, the, I think. For us to come out, it, it gives us a chance as councillors to meet with our MLA, to meet with our Member of Parliament, to advocate for our, all of our residents. And we've said right from the start that we're not just councillors for our districts, we're councillors for the whole region. So when something is held in, in Liverpool, um, for any of us who, who live outside of there, it, it's, a, it's a $20, $25 charge for gas just to get there and back every time. And I don't think anybody would be surprised to, to find out that we're the lowest paid councillors in all of Nova Scotia. So for us to have to come and do our jobs, what we feel is our job to do, and then have to take the money out of our pockets is, uh, is a little counterintuitive. I, I really, uh, I feel fairly strongly about that. And I think it's gonna take, uh, it's gonna make it harder for the rural representatives to continue to do their jobs as costs go up if they're gonna be refused their, their expense claims to come and do what we're asking them to do. Other comments? Yeah, and before I just, Councillor Charleston, to your point, our councillor can travel to any meeting outside of Queens with permission of council or permission of their CAO. So they cannot do it independently. They can't just see something on the NSFM site and say, oh, there's a whatever meeting in Halifax. I think I'll go today. It does. It clearly states permission of the CAO or a motion to council. Councillor Charlton. Thank you. Um, and I was not aware that there were expense claims uh, not being covered. So that makes it. Yeah, I understand. Um, so my apologies for not realizing that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask and it had come up last year. There was um, a big NSFM meeting, I believe it was last January, and the uh, morning of was bad weather. So does this policy, uh, my understanding was then it had to be a motion of council and we just happened to be at a council meeting that that travel be approved for any members who wanted to be able to go in because it was a meeting that a vote was taking place at that time. Um, so I'm just wondering in circumstances like that, um, if that needs to be, uh, I guess, re-clarified in a policy such as this. Are you specifically speaking about NSFM meetings? Uh, not particularly NSFM. I guess that would probably be the only thing I can think of at this time. But if there was, I mean, I don't know what else it would be besides NSFM. And now they've changed their um, membership to be able to vote online. But I just wondered based off of that happening last year, maybe we don't need to visit it if it's not going to happen again, but I just well, wanted to ask. It clearly states for councils, council, attendance at conference, workshops, meetings, meaning outside the district, where council or the chief administrator officer has approved the attendance. So if there suddenly were a sudden meeting and the, our chief administrator officer felt they were um, need it to attend then then they could seek they could get approval from the chief administrative officer but the question is at uh, councillor musery do you have to leave us so the that's the question so do you want to here's a suggestion 
Do you want to just think about your thoughts? There's not going to be any change on this drastically today. Do you want to think about your thoughts over the next holiday and revisit this again? I see nods. Yep. Nods. So we'll revisit this as a further discussion. Perhaps you have time to think about how it changed. Councillor Brown? Yeah, just one other thing that I, I remember that came up in the past that's, that part, wasn't part of our policy, but when the NSFM uh, fall convention was in White Point, um, I had a I had a 120 kilometer trip each way inside of Queens County, but I couldn't get approved for a room at the hotel. It probably cost as much for the travel expense to go back and forth to the conference, driving on, on foggy roads as it did to stay there. But our policy didn't allow to book a room in inside of Queens County, even though most of the people there drove a shorter distance than I did. That's true. Shelburne was closer. So perhaps we'll just put some thoughts on paper, send them off to send them off to our CEO so we can have further discussion on this at our next meeting. Queen's Place and Mayor Center concessions proposal, Mr. Burns. Um, there's a proposal within your package that sounds wonderful. And I'm hopeful that uh, council will give notice to um, to bring this forward and it's dealing with the concession booth at Queen's Place. I would just like to take a, a moment uh, to uh, bring some context to the request before you. Um, on Friday, November 24th, the uh, Qantas Club President Dave Schofield, who's in attendance here today, um, um, approached me uh, at Queen's Place Amira Center and proposed that the Kiwanis Club of Liverpool uh, as a project of theirs um, take over the canteen operation uh, temporarily um, basically for lack of a better term I guess would be during this particular ice season. Um, uh, Mr. Schofield proceeded to uh, send a formal letter and outlining the request and then on December the 4th um, um, Mr. Schofield and I had another brief conversation uh, to ensure I was clear on what the proposal entailed and this is what you find before you. So the request is that the Kiwanis uh, Club of Liverpool operate uh, concessions um, as an endorsed activity of the club and that the Kiwanis Club of Liverpool would be the overseeing organization of a number of organizations um, that could have an opportunity at the facility to raise some extra funds, um, which will include Queens County Blades primarily, with perhaps some support from the Queens County Meyer Hockey Association. Um, their idea is to uh, open um, for times they feel they have uh, sufficient volunteers during uh, tournaments and selected ice activity. The Kiwanis Club um, will be res would be responsible uh, to provide uh, over overriding insurance, uh, general liability insurance, um, that will protect the premises and the uh, operators. And they would acquire a temporary seasonal eating establishment permit um, that would give them authority to be in the canteen. As well, they would ensure that uh, appropriate food safety um, certifications um, that would be required for a number of, of volunteers uh, within the uh, operation be acquired. Um, so we're looking for really you know, two, two things here this morning. Uh, first of all, um, an endorsement of a potential perhaps six month term um, to operate the canteen service at Queen's Place. And um, going forward, um, should we be looking at, again, putting out um, a request for proposal and uh, try acquire a permanent um, uh, operator, um, looking at terms of upwards of two to five years. Sounds like a wonderful cooperation between service groups, nonprofits, and it provides food service for people who are in the rink. So thank you, Mr. Schofield, for 
and the Kiwanis. Comments? Councillor Brown. Yeah, I think this is wonderful. I mean, we've been trying for a long time to put uh, somebody in that facility. We've, we've got a good facility there for them to use. It just seems like we can't get anybody to, to set up. And I think if, if the Kiwanis were looking at, at being the long-term owner, as a, to use you know the wrong term, but we're the owner, but, but if they're looking to organize it and partner with the, uh, the Blades and the, the hockey I think you have groups that have a buy in there and they have they have a reason to be there and a reason to see us succeed. It looks like a good way forward to me and, and I'm just wondering, you know, is six months too long for them? Should we should we give them more of an opportunity? Are they looking at at asking for a longer term approach? Because we've seen that all these RFPs we've put out, people try it for a season, it doesn't work. People try it for a season, it doesn't work. These guys I think could make it work. Uh, initially, initially they're looking uh, uh, to do this short term, and they've expressed uh, that they would step aside if a permanent option uh, were to be acquired. And just on a, just on a note of, uh, I guess, um, operation in the last uh, year and a half, um, the Junior B Hockey Club, um, when they were uh, when they were here, um, successfully operated the canteen uh, under a bit of a different model but under Dave Schofield's tutelage and um, that was part of the team's contract that they had an option or that they could operate provided they had the proper insurances and certifications etc and then again uh, this summer the Hank Snow Society um, through their event contract um, successfully operated the canteen during the Hank Snow tribute. Um, so both of these, you know, all these organizations are not-for-profits, and uh, that that has worked so far. Now the challenge, you know, coming is that we know we are going to host um, Curl Canada again, uh, December 2024 into early, you know, January uh, 2025. So, you know, certainly... Uh, going back out to uh, the public and uh, seeing if we can acquire a permanent operator. Could be a good decision. Um, otherwise, um, perhaps we have something that, you know, could, could be an option here. So, thank you. Councillor Fancy? Yes, yeah, so I think this is well, it's, you know, it's what we've been looking for because it's always been, we've had different people that couldn't do it year round. It just, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't advantageous to them. So this way they, you get someone who's working with other clubs, so then they don't have to always take on all the responsibility. So everybody's working with it. And I think that the other part that I really like is that uh, we have some, a group that have proven themselves rather than just somebody coming in and saying, I can do this, and have no idea what they were, they were getting into. I mean, Dave may be a little gray-haired, but he can still do it. So uh, we, uh, I, I, like the, I like the idea. I like what they're, the simplicity of what they want to try to do with food and things, and it's, I think it's all obtainable. So, thank you. One final comment. Um that I would make is that we work closely with uh, Department, Nova Scotia Department, Environment and Climate Change, Food Safety Division, um, on a variety of issues around food safety for events, you know, that we host uh, on the waterfront or events that we host at Queen's Place. So uh, just, just letting you know that. Councillor Gidney. Thank you. Um, I had an opportunity to, to meet with the Kiwanis concerning this. Um, there's some couple of points I want to put up. They've been here for 93 years. They've given back to the community continuously. Um, they're into a lot of stuff. And the, the big thing is they're mostly for kids. And, and the latest thing that they, they give was one of the Special Olympic athletes. They give them 1500 to so they could travel to games this year. Um, what, what I'm... I'm so impressed that like, they'll go in and they'll do a good job. And there's no question in my mind that this is for them. Um, one thing that came up in our conversation was that 
they would like to have one, a one-year lease to get them an opportunity to see how it would work and for us to get an opportunity to see how it was going to work for us. Um, and, and I would also suggest no rent. That would be my, my and, and I support this 100%. Thank you. So before we ask for this to come back at our next meeting with a motion that there are some points that uh, Councillor Gibney brought up, um, first one being rent free. Um, what if just I need to get staff a uh, council's opinion on that? Do you feel that um, it should be available at a no charge? We already heard Council Gibney spoke. We know his we know his opinion. What about the rest of you, Councillor Brown? I think we're we're looking at a lot of nonprofit groups who are you know we all know that they're struggling to to make ends meet and, and and to come up with funding and I think this is an opportunity for us to provide a service for the people who use our facility, but also to help fund nonprofit organizations to to succeed and thrive in in our community and I think it's a win for everybody if we can provide a service without having to pay somebody to come in and do it. So I I, I would be okay with no rent. Might a might a suggestion be rent free for six months rather than a rent free for a year, and that way after six months they could renegotiate. Um, they would have their stats to be able to say if they were doing or losing. It would put you put them into you know they could always ask for an extension, um, but that would a rent a rent free for six months. And then reconsideration of 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 then at that point in time because they're they're going to have to determine if they're going to have enough volunteer base to fill it in. Who knows? Perhaps even the Liverpool Track Society may join in. I know they're a group that needs to raise a tremendous amount of money. Um, so, Councillor Guinea, what would you? No, what I, would you say? I would say no. Given the the year free. Um, all the money that they 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 break break in, they give out. Like they don't. It, it's a service group. They have no paid members. They don't. Everything comes in, goes out. In a quote that they told me the other day, we make the money to give it away. So so instead of us stamp, stepping in and taking it, this would be our contribution to the community. Also, let them have it rent free. Okay, so let's have a discussion on that point. Rent free one year. Is that what you want to see come back? Councillor Charlton. Thank you. Um, I was under the assumption when I read this recommendation that the Kiwanis Club was just requesting six months um, with the note here about how if there was, uh, you know, someone who wanted to operate it, that they'd step aside. So in hearing Councillor Guinea's comments that they would like to be given the year, I certainly would uh, be okay with that. And I think if a not-for-profit group wants to step up and volunteer countless hours to run that canteen and provide a service that we haven't been able to, um, that they should be able to do that rent free. So that would be my view. So that's what we're going to, Mr. Byrne? Um, not that we're negotiating here, I guess, but it, it may be prudent to just, you know, certainly if, if you're going to do the year, um, certainly take a look at the six month window and say, you know, how are we doing? That being the, you know, Dave and his team, how are they doing? Um, because again, you know, if, if we're going one year and we do it this month, then we're going to miss the curling event. So, you know, then uh, we're into looking for another operator there. So. You won't be getting a motion today. This is discussion item. Mm -hmm. So a motion will not be coming back until January. Perfect. So we it would window. run. It would run through to through the Canada curling. Yeah. Good. So is that council's wish to um, rent free for one year service club organizations? Do you not want to have just a check in at six month time, but or that's th things like that could be written in in director. <clears throat> yes. Um, I would just, uh, one point um, is if we have a contract in place for the Hank Snow tribute next summer, um, they normally run that um, canteen as a fundraiser for themselves as well. I guess the direction 
would be that then we would not have that as part of that contract should they request it and it would remain with the Kiwanis just as a point so that we know moving forward what the expectation is. Thank you, Director. Uh, we know that was an excellent point because if, if Hank Snow are there next year, that is an important part of their revenue is running that canteen. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you ask the Qantas Club to pack it up and leave, take all their supplies out, store them somewhere else, and bring them back in, and then you run in trouble with food handlers when you do that? Or do they turn their, perhaps they do a partnership and all the money during Hank Snow raised by those volunteers goes to Hank Snow? So the, so the eating establishment permit is not transferable, and... You know, a consideration could be that, you know, during the window of time Hank Snow uh, Tribute was operating, that the Kiwanis Club operation um, step aside, step down, and then re-engage again, like September 1, um, as you head into the fall. So, I mean, you can certainly talk to Mr. Schofield about those types of things. Um, that way you don't have multiple operators in there at the same time. That's when you have an issue. So th does that sound okay for Mr. Burns to negotiate with Mr. Schofield um, during that Hank Snow window of four or five days and look at one year rent free for service clubs? Yes. So we're in agreement with that. So we'll see that forward at our first meeting in January. And last but not least, library selection. So if you look at 7.6 in your package, and knowing that we will not be making a motion on this, we have heard from various people today. We've received many pieces of email and calls and word on the streets. You all know my position, so I'm not going to speak on this because I've always supported an elsewhere site, but I need to hear from you as council on um, what you wish to do, temporary, permanent, try to stay where you are, organizational community committee, Reestablishment and good operation of the library committee. I believe people are waiting to hear from you. So, who's first? Councillor Amaro. I can be first. Um, <laughs> I've heard from many residents, um, residents that are in favor of Queen's Place area, residents that um, are in favor of the call center area. Um, they like repurposing the building. Um, we're putting two million in the HVAC system. Um, so they like the idea of that. I've heard from people that do not even want a library. So we've had multiple emails, um, especially over the last few weeks. Um, Susan is correct. I don't think she should be the only public voice on that committee. Uh, we had two resign, and I think we should put an ad out there um, and have um, those two replaced as soon as possible, even before we have, I don't think we should have another meeting until it's done. Um, I'd also like to invite Councillor Brown back. I had only sit in on a couple meetings. I was just kind of thrown in it, and he was removed rather abruptly. Um, which I don't think any of us appreciated, and um, I know he didn't. So I would like him definitely back on the committee since he has um, been three quarters of the way he's been he's been involved. Um, and I think we need to listen to the public as well. Um, I think we need to uh, look at this maybe as a temporary location. And um, we need definitely more public consultation. Um, we had a little bit of online. We had a little bit at the um, library. But I don't think it was enough 
for everybody to give their views. So I think it would be, this is a very important subject and I think that um, we need to have it in different areas of the community, not just in Queens. I think we need to have it in Port Patoon. We need to have it in Caledonia. I think we need to get everybody's view since everybody uses the library. Um, we're all in agreement. We need a safe and viable place for this library. Um, we were just trying to brainstorm as fast as we could to get them out of the position that they're in now. The only, um, I guess, thing that the library has to consider is it is not going to be a full library set up as it was approached to be um, with all the rooms designated. Um, if we're going to just make this a temporary library, it'll probably be just an open space with washrooms. I mean, we have to do some work to it as well, but not to the extent that um, we were planning on doing. Um, Councillor Muse did advise me that he is not in favor of making it a temporary location. He wants to make it a full-time location. So I just want to put that out there because he had to leave um, for personal reasons abruptly. Um, but that is my that is my opinion on it. Um, thank you, Council Romero. And just to clarify for those who are in attendance, councils serve for two years on certain committees. It's just the way we do things. Councillor Brown was on the library committee for two years. Two years come to an end, so it wasn't like he was pulled away. Um, the general rule is you you sit on a committee for two years. Then you move on another committee. He did wish to stay on that committee. However, um, it just didn't work that way. So, and Councillor Merrill will have to figure out that's a different change in terms of reference. If you are going to give up your chair, um, as anyway, those are discussions you have to make later on. But the terms of reference clearly states that who's on the committee and you were on the committee because you're a representative on the social library board so in order for councillor brown to be on that committee then he either has to be you or the terms of reference have to be adapted and also i would just like to note that if a court you know if it becomes a temporary then how what looks like in a temporary has yet to be decided but so the question is, um, since Councillor Romero brought up the word temporary, perhaps we should talk about that. And if it is temporary, what do we do about a permanent location? I think she was right on the spot when she said, um, as a council, we need to have more public engagement. We need to, for people to understand what a library is and the purpose it serves. So perhaps comments on temporary versus permanent. One good thing I did think about, that building was built for one sole use, and that was for a call center company many years ago that wanted the entire building. To make modifications, to put in an extra bank of washrooms and an extra door simply makes it more attractive for a future business. Because if a future business wants to go in there and it's not global empire, they're going to need what we did for the accountants. They're going to need a separate door. They're going to want separate washrooms and they're probably going to want their own staff area. So investing money for temporary is not that off the mark. However, Councillor Gidney. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with, with Councillor Amuro. Um, I just want to point out this has been a roller coaster ride for the last year and a half. There's been a lot of different things going on. I'm not going to get into the weeds with it, but there's information, things that happened that just caused a lot of confusion uh, and, and everything. Um, I, I agree that we should use it as a temporary location, um, which would give us time to find the, the permanent location. And would also, because there's no way we're going to build it for $3 million. There's just no way that's, that's ever going to happen. So that would give us opportunity to apply for provincial and federal grants. And if we could get into that, we could build a really nice library. So that's, that's my thoughts on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kidney. Councillor Brown? 
Yeah, I, I agree with uh, everything that's been said so far on that. I think if we make that a, a temporary facility at whatever level we settle on, it buys us time to, to get the public engagement that we need because I think what we saw today is that everybody has a different idea of what a library should be and that changes day to day, week to week. So I think we have to do a better job of, of getting more engagement from the public so that we can build what what the public wants and needs. You know, I think we were under a lot of time crunch when, when we set up this, that uh, the lease was ending, we were not gonna have library services, and we came up with the best possible solution that we had, given the time frame that we had. And it's, it's a thankless position for anybody that's on these committees. Um, but I, I think, you know, now if we, can, if we can make this a temporary, it gives us a chance to take a deep breath, look at it, analyze it, and do the job right in the long run. And I think the public will be much better served if we get it done right rather than if we get it done quick. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Councillor Charlton, you're late. There you are. The camera turns as soon as you put your mic on, so I just want to make sure you're good. Um, I would agree. This has been a really difficult process. I think um, from the moment we had our uh, surplus, we should have went out in our communities and said what matters to all of you and to everyone else in this community. There's been a lot of hard lessons learned here at this table, especially for myself as a new councillor. Um, I do think that the costs for the library originally were grossly underestimated, and I think that had that building proceeded, we'd be in a pickle where we were trying to figure out how to fund uh, something that was severely over budget. So I most certainly value library services. I don't want our community to not have a library, which is why I've been supportive of this space here. Um, I can get on board with it being temporary, most definitely. I think that we do have to do these things that Councilor Miriam and Councilor Brown, Councilor Gideon mentioned about sitting down, public engagement, huge in public engagement. We can't expect everyone to get here. There are so many of you here today, but I'm sure there are many who, who want to be here, can't be here, doesn't suit their needs. <coughs> we need to go in these communities, um, as mentioned, and find out what's important to people. We're getting ready to come into another budget season. Uh, there are many other factors that are important to people besides just a library, not discrediting a library, just to be clear. Um, I think that we do need to hit a reset button, put the library in a secure space where we can have it um, to prevent people who rely on that service to not being able to access one entirely, but looking at it from a lens of, okay, how can we do this and make it work? Because when this was first presented, it was that it wouldn't affect our taxpayers, but as this process has progressed, and this was the, uh, my reasoning to rescind it originally, was because the cost just kept coming out of nowhere and the information kept changing, um, which has made this very difficult. I think if we're trying to acquire grants and such to build something so significant, we're probably in a three to five year process, would be my understanding of what I understand here now. So, um, if our CAO and his experience could maybe comment on, um, I, I know he's had some experience with other builds of what we even ballpark will be looking at, because I think the difficulty has lied for members of the community is that this council has earmarked $3 million and just decided not to build a library. And, and that's really not just it. That's not. So I think that part is also important, um, if you could. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't think um, I don't think with uh, today's cost three million dollars is sufficient to build a new building. Um, I think sometimes it gets complicated when um, across the board you see different buildings go up and people start making assumptions about what that costs. Different locations, different designs, different considerations, all sorts of things play into that cost. Um, you know, I I could see a library costing words of $10 million. That's not unreasonable in today's expenses. But I think, um, I think what I'm hearing um, for at least council is they want some more numbers. Um, they, they want some more consultation, those sorts of things. So we can certainly bring it back. I will reiterate what I reiterated at the last meeting, which is um, it takes time to do capital work. So wherever that library is going to go, if it's not going to stay where it is, we need some direction from council soon 
around what that's going to look like so we can get on with it because there are trades that take months and months and months to get. Um, and so I don't want you to end up in a situation where there, there's not a home for that library. So, yeah. And yeah, Councillor Chapman. Thank you. And I just like to clarify that I don't see an issue with what's in the package about moving forward as Mayor Norman, you noted, uh, those ex uh, renovations rather would have to be done anyways for it to be able to suit anything else that's a vacant space. So I think if based off of my knowledge of we're three to five years out from a new library, like a new build, um, if you look at other costs that we've dealt with, um, yes, a million dollars is significant, but to give the library a vibrant space as, as great as it can be for that duration, I mean, I don't have a problem with that. I'd just like to note that. I believe what Councillor Charlton has indicated are the diagrams that were included by the project manager may very well not end up. But again, um, we're over speaking on behalf of a library steering committee. Um, it would be their recommendations as to understanding the fact you don't want to spend too much money on a temporary, but yet you need to make it so another business could someday move in it and yet something that could accommodate. Um, Deputy Mayor Fancy? I'll start off by saying to begin with, I would say that my first choice for a library would be to have a brand new library over in the location that we, we decided and looked at. That, and I think that would be for a lot of counselors here so when I hear even other counselors say, well, I'm, I'm for this, but, uh, you know, I'll go with this other way. No, I, I think we're all on, the, on board. We would love to have that new library. But the, the problem came right at the beginning was that uh, it was, we were allotted $3 million to work with. And, and uh, that's what we had with the 2.2 and the 0.8 coming from a different, from another funding. And... That three million dollars was never ever going to cover the cost of the library, so it isn't a matter of starting something and then you can't finish it or get in there and then where we're going to get the money from. So right from the beginning, it was always a problem. Um, I feel badly for the committee because uh, even at the beginning we had asked about the call center because we knew the cost was going to be high, and we and our direction was given by. I'll say it, our former CAO, that we could do that. We, we couldn't do that because uh, the cement wasn't good enough. So we, we walked away from it. It isn't like we brought something up new later on. That was brought up early on, but we but, uh, it was told we couldn't do that. And the numbers, even was our former CAO saying it was going to be $3 million. Uh, there was no engineering or anything else designed for why it was $3 million. It was just... I don't know where the number came from in the first place. But that, so when we look at that, we had two projects going on. One was going to be the, the pool. The pool was said it was going to be $3 million. Well, as we look further into now getting designs and such as for the pool, the pool is not $3 million. It's going to be 7 to $8 million. And we would not be going forward, I would think we would not be going forward even considering a pool if it wasn't for a generous donation of $3 million from a, from, from a group. And we, we are so thankful for that. You know, we're limited to what monies we have here. We're limited to what we can do. So when people get mad at us and say, well, you've cho chosen to put it over here rather than over there, and you're putting the blame back on the council, the council has got only so much money to work with. Uh, at the beginning, I asked about grants even for the library. And we said, no, we're not going to write grants for it. And that was, again, going back to a certain, certain person. And, uh, and so we never, ever wrote for grants. We were talking about the pool. We weren't going to write for grants, but we're, going to, but we're now considering writing grants for the pool. If we want to go forward and even consider putting a library over to where, where uh, the talk about it is, there's got to be money. There's got to be grant money. Uh, that's not to say when we talk about here that it still won't be going over here and staying over here to the call center. Let's, let's get it out in the open because if we don't have the money, we can't do it. 
we just talked about a $12 million project here for sewer water and uh, looking forward to growing our area and trying to make it vet bigger and to uh, be able to expand. And, be, and we're going to have housing issues coming up, which we have right now. There's going to be monies going out everywhere. So we, we can't be just looking and say, well, this, we've got to fix this here. No, we're going to have to work with what we have. If we can get, uh, as like we said, if we had a, we had a $3 million donation come in, it would change our mind, or change my mind greatly about where we could build a library. But that library, that $3 million, was never going to fit. Even two years ago, it wasn't going to fit. We could call center over here. We're putting out almost a $2 million heating system in to make that operate. How are you going to do a $2 million heating system and build the, the library structure for a million? It just it, it isn't going to work. So with that being said, we have to look at all these things. And that's why I, uh, I, I'm really proud of our council for standing up and making tough choices. There's going to be tough choices when, when these things are all said and done. I'm okay with us putting that over there temporary and looking at it, but that doesn't mean, remember, that doesn't mean that we aren't gonna stay there if we don't have the money to, to go forward. That's our direction that we're gonna have to do financially. That's um, from my opinion. So I don't like to see is it look at saying, well, some councils believe that we could, that I'm against it going over there. And uh, no, I think we're all, for the most part, want to see a new building over there if we don't have the monies, do we have to work within the budgets we have? And I think that's a budget restraint is for all of us. So we have to, when we look at these things, we have to make sure that we're looking at all considerations and what we're going to do. Susan, I feel badly that you were, that, uh, you know, that these things weren't brought up to you and talked to you about and, and we even know right from the start where we were. Because I feel like you've said, like you've seen something come forward this way and all of a sudden just pull back. I feel badly for the, uh, the committee to think that they were given a direction to go build a new building and then say, no, it's not going to be there anymore. We're going over here because we made a choice to go here. It's been a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say bad decisions on the council because I think the council did every decision they had on what the information they had. And they could only do what they, they did. So uh, I'm, I'm not putting blame back on council. I'm saying we work with the information we had. So with that being said, I'm for if we can get the monies, but if we can't get the monies, we're going to have to have to make decisions. It's not always going to be pleasing to everyone. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Fancy. Anyone else wish to speak? So from what I have heard, then we, Theo Jodry, do you have anything you'd like to say? Just maybe suggesting a path forward perhaps might be um, for us to do some uh, come back to council with a community engagement plan um, for the future. Um, I think if the, if if you're going to continue down that path, unfortunately, that the scope of that committee also needed to take into consideration the cost. Otherwise, it's a moot point. And I think that's what's happened. They, You've got one group who's come up with a great idea, and you're stuck trying to figure out how to fund it. And I think that's partly what the deputy mayor said. So perhaps a community engagement plan, and we can certainly sit down with the committee and talk about what maybe that looks like. Um, bring that back to to council um, for their consideration. And in the meantime, I still think the items that were listed in that report whether we're talking about a permanent or temporary, there is some work that needs to, um, I'm not advocating for that, for anything in particular. What I'm trying to communicate to council is I'm worried about the timelines and our ability as staff to deliver on your expectations. Um, just being really blunt about that. Um, and that's why I'm pushing for, I think we need to at least have some clarity from council about at least what even a temporary plan would look like because I'm worried about the timeline. Um, so those would be two things that we go forward with some of that work, um, which again, for clarity, a lot of that renovation can be covered under your gas tax money anyway, right? So I think that's something. And then the other thing is for us to work with the committee uh, and other stakeholders and try to come up with an engagement plan everyone can get behind and um, and and go from there. And CAO Jodry's point, 
would it would we not be remiss if we did not and I, I realize it's going to be difficult to call a steering committee together with two members that have now resigned but when I'm looking at the at the plans like are they really required for a temporary library for three you know for maybe two or three years can there be some scaling back on these because I think if we're thinking temporary, then we need to think temporary. So they need some programming, washrooms, but yet designed for a different owner. Building that is a one owner, one use facility was probably a great mistake at the time when council built that. Um, and we do have some smart staff and project manager who could probably talk to the chief librarian and come up with some designs to come back to council for what, a temporary, yeah. a bare minimum temporary would look like, um, would, would, be a, would be, I think, a suggestion. We don't want to waste taxpayers' money, throw a lot of money at something that's going to be a temporary, and then pull roots up and, and build permanent. But yet, we also know that we're very, it's, it's very thin ice in the present location. And even if things changed and the lease could be extended past that time, if the building was viable, who knows? Because there's, there's so many unknowns in this factor. Um, anyway, so council, what's your, so I heard temporary. Councillor Charlton. I just have a question, I guess, to our CAO. Um, would it make sense for there um, to be a motion made for that uh, to come back on our next council meeting? Uh, it was a motion. We've moved it to discussion, so there's no motion. Um, or would it make sense for council to direct staff to go back to the chief librarian, as Mayor Norman said, for some context? I just... I don't want to, uh, I guess, put a motion forward uh, specific to what was in this agenda package if it comes back and it's problematic and it can't really be amended because of the time frame. So I just, that's where my thoughts are, if you could. Yeah, I think um, maybe the best path forward, at least my suggestion at the moment, would be um, that you direct staff to bring some recommendations back, not necessarily what those are, and that we would work with stakeholders and groups to try to bring something back um, quickly that everyone can get behind. Um, yeah, that might be the better wording to go forward, to give us some latitude to try to make this all work better. And those would have to come back as discussion points so we can flush them out because there, there may be a variety of options. There will be. There will be. Um, and I know we've got the interveners, we've got big things on the plate that have to be mm -hmm. into the courts by January 22nd. So the earliest I would project that things would come back for discussion would be the end of January's council meeting. Thanks for saying that. That is absolutely <laughs> realistic. Yes, yeah, there's a lot going on it would, and, and Christmas is in the yeah. middle of all of this. So, yeah. So at the very earliest, council would expect um, a report back with some discussion and some suggestions at the end of January at the early at the earliest because the first of January is not going to make a council meeting. Uh, when I look at my calendar, Wednesday, so council would be the ninth. The office is closed until the third which means that's council agenda day. That's the day the agenda goes out. And so the 23rd would be the very earliest, considering the 22nd is the day when all those papers have to be filed for interveners for the court stuff. So it would be that at the earliest. So would council be satisfied with the 23rd as the earliest date? knowing it might very well be February. 
Councillor Gidney? Under the circumstances, yes. I, I agree under the circumstances. I think we have to look at this and get it done right. And I think trying to pound a round peg into a square hole has not gotten us very far so far. So I think take a little bit of extra time. It might save us some extra time down the road. Anyone disagree that if we look at the the 30th, knowing that it may not be the 30th and it might be the 13th of February? That's fine? Fine. So you have your direction? Yep. And I will thank you all, Councillor Brown. I, I was just going to suggest that uh, if... If, if we do find ourselves in a time crunch down towards the end of January and, and things are there rather than waiting until the middle of February to, to do this, we still have the option of holding a special council meeting by Zoom or, or something to do that. If, if we find ourselves really in a time crunch, we can make things work a little bit faster, but not necessarily have to. Well, we just heard that our engineering department is taking on some huge tasks and some capital work, and they have a lot of decisions, and uh, CEO Jojery is going to have to talk with them and come back with what they re realistically can and cannot do on that capital plan. And as we all know, um, October 24 comes close, and I suspect this, this whole new build will be in the hands of a new council. So, But we still need to get our head around whether or not that lease can even get extended in the present location because that might be a possibility too. Who knows? And I will thank you all for attending and for your patience. Councillor Romero? Just one question. Can we, um, in the meantime, get an ad out there for two more members of the public for the steering committee as well, please? That can be done. That can be done fairly quickly. And on that note, I thank everyone for your patience. Come back anytime. No. <laughs> we like to hear your voices. And one thing I would like to say is we hired a new CAO um, based upon his belief that community consultation is very important. And I think as a council, we all identify the fact that for one reason or another, we have not really reached out to our, counts, to our constituents listen to their voice on not only this matter, but many, many matters. Um, we like to call him our healing, our healer. He's going to try to nope. help us heal um, some relationships between all kinds of things, and we look forward to improving during our 2024 year. So I will ask for a motion for in-camera. Moved by Councillor Charlton, seconded by Councillor Brown. All those in favor? Passed.